Okay, thank you so much. Fellas, we'll hear one more song from them later on. Your life is going to be defined by what you hear when you listen and what you see when you look. Your life is going to be defined by what you hear when you listen and what you see when you look. And we see a great illustration of that in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where two men saw the same scene and heard the same sounds but responded in completely different ways. For one man, what he saw when he looked, what he heard when he listened, was trouble. For the other, what he saw when he looked, and what he heard when he listened, was opportunity. Take all the literature that has ever been written in all the world, take all the novels and plays and movies that have ever been written in all the world, that ever included a scene of battle, and there is not one as well known as famous as this one. Even by people who never read, never saw, never paid much attention to anything else, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. But I find as interesting as the encounter between David and Goliath, the differences between Saul and David who saw the same thing, who heard the same sounds, but who responded in completely different ways. So it's an amazing scene. You have a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other, and a valley separating two armies. One mountain per army, one battlefield ready-made in the valley between. On one mountain, the Philistines. On the other mountain, the Israelis, the Hebrew army. You have Saul, the first great king of Israel. Huge guy by Israeli standards. Stood head and shoulders, literally head and shoulders above everybody else. Looked like a king. He was the leader of Israel. You have on the other side the Philistine army, and we don't know anything about the Philistine army except one soldier. Goliath. And we meet him when he steps into that valley, clothed in his armor, armor that weighed about 125 pounds. That's a pretty big load to carry. Spear that weighed, oh, 25 pounds. That's a pretty big spear. Stepped out on the field of battle and said, I challenge you to send one man out to fight me. And the battle between the two of us will determine the outcome of the war. You kill me, we're done. I kill you, you're done. Who will come and fight Goliath? He did that again and again because no one ever responded to the challenge. Until one day, the shepherd boy, youngest of a bunch of brothers, his brothers were in the army. He was too young to be there in the army, probably a teenager, came in the camp, heard the challenge looked around and wonder why no one responded. Saul heard the challenge of Goliath, listened to the challenge of Goliath. And as Saul listened to the challenge of Goliath, he heard trouble and death. David heard the challenge of Goliath. But he did not hear the challenge. He heard the call of God. One, the voice of Goliath was in his ear. The other, the voice of God was in his ear. 
And what a difference it made. As Saul heard the voice of Goliath, he heard all the problems that could grow out of that. David saw and heard all the opportunity that could come out of that. I want you to imagine being in the Israeli army and you look around the camp and the biggest guy in the camp is the king who says nothing when the challenge is made. I want you to imagine being in that army when the only guy who said something is this kid who comes in bringing some food to his brothers, hears the challenge, and begins to wonder what's going to happen. The king posts a reward for anyone who will go out and do it, but he says nothing himself about taking the challenge. What voice do you hear when you listen? Most people hear the voice of the world around them and all the challenges and all the difficulties that that world presents. But there are some who when they hear, they hear the voice of God. They hear God saying, I am calling you to spend a life serving me when someone else thinks of how difficult that calling may be. They hear God saying, you will be in my hand when I send you to a dangerous place. When others are hearing only the danger that's in that place if they go. What do you hear when you listen? Saul heard the voice of Goliath. David heard the call of God. They looked and they saw something completely different. When Saul looked, he saw a warrior trained to fight. He saw a man ready for his profession. We see that when we look at, in uh, chapter 17 at, at verse uh, 31. When David starts responding to this challenge of Goliath, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. I want you to imagine how that sounded. Here's the king. He's the biggest guy in the camp. He has said nothing. Here's this kid who's too young to officially be in the army. And he says, just relax, everybody. I got this covered. It's mine. And Saul responds by saying to David, verse 33, Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. Goliath didn't have to explain how good he was. You know, when you do things, you know the signs of people who do that thing well. I don't know if any of you have ever put on a football uniform with all the pads that you wear and the taping that you do. The first time you ever do that, it feels very awkward and moving just feels kind of funny. But when you watch those players in the NFL on a Sunday afternoon run and jump and leap and play and make plays, they don't look like they're even wearing that uniform. You know when you put it on that if you raise your hand, your shoulder pads choke your neck. And you know how confining some of those things can be and how odd it is. But when you do it all the time, you lose every sense of the uniform and you move with the fluid grace that everybody can see. Saul was king and Saul had been in battles and Saul knew a fight. And he looked out there and what he saw was a man trained for the profession of war. He had the armor, top of the line, good stuff repel just about every kind of weapon unless you were at very close range. He saw how he moved. It should have been heavy and awkward. When David tried to put armor on later on, he felt very uncomfortable, very awkward. This guy moving with a fluid grace. This was a man who was not in his first fight. This was a man who'd been doing this a long time. He had grown into the role. When I say grown, 10 feet. That's about how big Goliath was. So you got Ten feet of man out there, clothed in bronze armor, carrying a huge weapon. 
I'll never forget being a high school senior and going to a conference in Atlanta. And we were staying in that conference at the Hyatt Hotel in downtown Atlanta, which had just opened at that time. And I'd gone out and I was just walking around to get some exercise. I was thinking about something. I was in another world. My wife has these strange stories about me spending so much time there. Don't believe those. But I was just in another world. I got out, I came back into the hotel. I walked in the door. I never broke stride. I walked to the elevator. The elevator doors were open without even looking up. I just kept walking onto the elevator. And as I walked onto the elevator, the door closed behind me for the first time. I looked up, and I was looking at belt buckles. I hardly ever feel small. Most people don't call me a small guy. But I looked around, and I was the only guy on the elevator who was not on the professional basketball team playing the Atlanta Hawks that day. And I had never seen so many huge guys in all my life. They were immense. There was Goliath. Huge, fluid, easy. This is what I do for a living, kid. Goliath. Saul saw a man trained for his profession. David? David saw next. When Saul said, why do you think you can kill him? David said, hey, killed a lion, killed a bear, time for a giant. <laughs> Next. David saw himself anointed for a mission by God. Samuel had come to David's home. Samuel had singled David out. Samuel had anointed David to be the next king of Israel under the direction of God. Goliath, a man with a profession. David, a man anointed for a mission. Oh, the difference that it makes. Yes, David prepared. Yes, God used his training as a shepherd to fight that lion and to fight that bear. And the lessons that he learned out there in the wilderness with those sheep stood him in good stead through all the years of his life. When he was running for his life, hiding from Saul who was trying to kill him. David was a great warrior. David was a great leader of men. And everything in his past, God used for his mission in the present. But the main thing in David's life was the anointing of God for that particular mission. And when you have the anointing, you don't see the giant. You see, next! This is what God has for me to do. And then what happened? I don't know if there are many passages in the Bible that are more stirring than what happened when David stepped onto the field of battle. He tried to put on Saul's armor. Saul asked him to. Couldn't wear it. Couldn't move in it. Didn't feel comfortable. Goliath felt comfortable in that. David did not. That's not who he was. He went out with just his sling, stopped and picked up five smooth stones. Why five stones? Was he afraid he might miss? No, I think he was just prepared in case Goliath had brothers. He goes out there with his five smooth stones. And as he steps onto the field, can you imagine what he looked like to Goliath? Professional warrior, wearing state-of-the-art hardware, weapons. He was ready for battle with another professional warrior. The stakes were the fate of the whole army. If the fate of the whole army is at stake, the Philistines sent out their best. And the Jews, the Israelis, sent out a kid. And Goliath taunts him. He can't believe that he's out there. The Philistine looked and he, and he saw David, who was but a youth, ruddy, a redhead, with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to see me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, boy, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistines, this is just amazing. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. 
This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And I will strike you down and I will remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Saul saw a giant. Saul saw his armor and his weapons. Saul saw the consequences of failure, death for him, defeat for the nation. David saw God ready to demonstrate his power and his glory. Now I want you to notice what happened. Saul responded to what he saw in the presence of Goliath and what he heard in the challenge of Goliath, Saul responded with fear. David saw the presence of Goliath, heard the challenge of Goliath, and David responded in faith. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. Let me bury an idea and not praise it. You are going to be defined by how you respond to the things you hear and the things you see that are difficult and challenging. Do you have a response of fear or a response of faith? Let there be no mistake about it. The life in ministry is not a life for the faint of heart. When you give your life to God and say, use me as you will, guess what? He will. He will direct you in places you might not choose. He may call you to do things that you're not really comfortable doing. If you say, Lord, here am I, send me, consider yourself sent. He will use you. And He rarely uses us in the things we find very easy and simple to do. Will you respond in fear or in faith? Still amazes me that Southern Baptists in 1917 voted to create a seminary from scratch. They'd never done that before. There were two other seminaries, Southern Seminary, Southwestern Seminary, started as independent schools, adopted by the Southern Baptist Convention, but they finally decided to start one from scratch. And they said, out of the whole United States, where will we put this first seminary we start from scratch? And they chose New Orleans, one of the most unbaptist places in the nation. What were they thinking? Five Southern Baptist congregations. Most of them were missions. What were they thinking? A city with a population predominantly composed of people with a deeply held religious belief, the Catholic Church, didn't have categories for things like faith in Christ and calling to serve Him and the preeminence of the Word of God. One of our early church planters wanted to start a church in a part of the city, and you know how he did it? He went to the grocery store on Fridays. On Fridays in that time, all Catholics were supposed to eat fish on Friday and not meat. He went to the grocery store, stood by the meat counter, and everybody who bought meat and not fish, he would say, would you like to be a part of a Baptist Bible study? <laughs> Do you know how we got to this property? When this property came on the market, our original location was in uptown New Orleans, and it was very cramped, and the seminary simply completely ran out of room. They could not grow. They had to have more space. Space is very scarce in New Orleans. And this piece of property came on the market after World War II, one of the largest pieces of property to ever come on the market in years and years in New Orleans. And the Baptists wanted to buy it, and so did the Catholic Church. They wanted to put a monastery and a school here. And the Baptist said, we could do without the monastery, but we'd like the school. And so, trying to negotiate, and the president then, Roland Q. Level, the man for whom this chapel is made, he had several meetings with a real estate agent who was a Catholic, very active Catholic. 
And he decided to set up one last meeting with him, and he said, Now, uh, you know that we Baptists would like to buy this property. We want to put our seminary there. We're completely out of room. We really do need that space for our seminary to be able to grow and be healthy. Uh, but I understand that the church, that's what local people call the Catholic Church, I understand the church also wants to buy the property. Now, and, and I know that you are a Catholic and very active in the church, which is fine. It just occurred to me, I needed to be sure you understood something. I know if you sell this property to the church, that they will expect you to take your full, they will expect you to donate your commission from the sale to the church as a donation and gift. But I want you to know if you sell this to the Baptist, we will expect you to take your full and rightful commission off of the sale. Here we are. <laughs> it's not easy making a way in a place like this. And Southern Baptist, in a time when they were far more rural than they are now, knew we needed a testing ground for ministers. For you to get just a bit of the experience that David had when he faced Goliath. For you to listen to all the voices out there about this city and decide what will you hear. Will you learn to hear the call of God in the midst of the voices? And when you look at this incredibly unusual and different place, will you learn to see what God is doing and what God wants? And so from the very beginning, this has been a place for people who hear the call of God. They don't just go to seminary can't tell you how many students said, Dr. Kelly, I knew this is the place God wanted me to go. They hear the call of God directing us to, to this place. They look at this city that is so different. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, was the first act to open our big theater downtown, the Sanger Theater, and they were asking him, what do you think about New Orleans? And he said, New Orleans is the only place where you can live in the United States and be in a foreign country. It's so different. But when they look, they see, this is where God wants me. And they make this decision to follow the Lord. A lot of unanswered questions. A lot of uncertainties. A lot of things they don't know about what's going to happen. How am I going to pay for all of it? I think I can get the first semester figured out. How am I going to pay for all of it? Don't know. What am I going to do? What's it going to be like with the family in New Orleans? And they make a decision to follow the Lord in faith. Now I will tell you I don't know when your moment will come. I don't know when it will come. It may come in the decision you're praying about now on seminary. It may come several years down the road. But I want to tell you, a moment is going to come when you are going to be standing between Saul and David. And you're going to look and you're going to understand Saul. Because what you have in front of you is difficulty, uncertainty, and you're going to hear what David heard, the voice of God saying, this is where I want you. And some point in your life, you're going to make that decision. Do I follow the call or not? Saul responded in fear. And his life was never the same. 
Do you think the soldiers in an army could ever respect a leader who stood silently while a kid said, God's got this? It's not our fight, it's God's fight. Do you think his soldiers ever looked at him the same again? David's life changed. Everybody there knew this kid has faith. Now, don't worry about when that moment will come. God will pick it in his time. It may come with this decision. It may come later on in your life, in your ministry. But be prepared when it comes. Because the one thing we want to do with all of our students at this seminary is to teach you. You will have no greater security than the security of knowing you're doing what God wants you to do. You will have no greater assurance than the assurance of knowing God has called me and anointed me for this purpose. You will have no greater confidence than knowing the battles he leads you to fight, they are the battles the Lord is fighting. And the challenges that you have in your life are not simply your challenges. They are God's. Your life will be defined by what you hear when you listen. What you see when you look. And we stand as a witness to you, saying to you, please, have faith. Follow the Lord. Would you join me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. To think out of all the people in the earth, you would speak specifically and directly to us, to all of us. Everyone in this place has the call of God on their life. We ask you, Father, to clarify that call for these who have come wondering what's the next step. What's the next chapter? Speak to their hearts, remove their doubt, fill them full of a knowledge and understanding of what you want them to do about this decision. But Father, I have a bigger prayer than that. I have a deeper yearning than that. I'm not interested in them becoming our students. What I really pray for them is that you would build in their heart and you would use this very process of making this decision they're facing. I pray, Father, that you would mold them and make them into a generation of men and women who will hear your call when they listen, who will see your presence when they look at whatever's in front of them, and who will make that determination in their soul, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, whatever else I accomplish with my life, I will follow the Lord. Oh, dear God, make them that kind of man and that kind of woman, for this is what our churches need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One last song. in our hearts he calls us into his adventure and gives us the courage to start we follow the lord we follow his voice hearing him call to our hearts we rush to the choice we will not look back we have no regrets we live our lives built on the world Drawn by the warmth of His grace, praying 
and our fears behind us, moving through restless seas, trusting him as our captain, not knowing where he would lead. We follow the Lord, we follow his voice, hearing him come to our hearts, we rest in the shores, we will not look back. God bless you. Lunch in the cafeteria. Fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love. 